I'm now going to turn it over to um, Professor Robert Kraft. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Is it still morning? Yes. Thank you, Byron. Uh, I want to tell you first some personal things. Uh, I've been retired for 10 years. I haven't talked to a group like this in a decade. I'm just a little bit rusty. Uh, nevertheless, my standing in front of you here really is an answer to a prayer. And a prayer I made when I was a very young professor in my middle 30s teaching in a big state university. I, I had grown up in large institutions. First in the Catholic Church. I was born a Catholic and really went to school in a Benedictine monastery. From there, almost directly, I went into public higher education. So I've been in higher education for a long time. And you know what? I found out after several years that they did not have the answers I was looking for. They were not there. And so much of what they were putting out there was a failure. It didn't work. It wasn't working for the people in it. And it became clear to me that it was, it was a kind of self-generating uh, system that kind of took care of everybody in it. But it wasn't accomplishing the stated goals for these institutions. Well, here I am, young professor, very young, and wondering, I'm going to work in this big system? Doing what exactly? OK, I don't want to get too heavy in that. But what I did was I prayed. And even though at that time in my life, it's pretty agnostic, but I prayed anyway, God, please, I want to know the truth. It's not fair that we who live on the earth and have this great opportunity, we have to operate in ignorance. Not fair. So please, God, I want the truth. Well, seek and you shall find. And then in the years following, maybe a decade or more, answers were kind of dumped in my lap. Direct answers. And of course, the Arantia book, which came along, was probably the most important, but it was at the end of a sequence of things. Now, let me start here. If you should get an email from me, you would see at the bottom of it a quotation from Carl Sagan, of all people. He said, I do not want to believe. I want to know. I want to know. OK, you all know Sagan is a scientist. And another scientist who said, who, this one happens to be a congressman whom I heard on TV interview, he said, scientists have a reverence for evidence. A reverence for evidence, of course. So for the next 20 minutes or so, or however much time we have, let's be scientists. Evidence. Well, let's see what the evidence tells us. In my life journey so far, I have always wanted to discover what's real, what I can know, beyond what others say they believe. And we've been listening to what others say they believe for how long? OK, what's real and how do I know? The law of gravity is real. Day and night are real. The evidence too obvious to mention. And this 2,000 page plus book called the Arantia book is real. And it has gripped so many readers, now published, as you know, in 17 languages. What kind of motivation would generate a desire on the, published, on, on the part of a person who is language specialist and wants to translate? Wow, is that real power, motivation, and as a, as a teacher, a professor, finally, I'm very interested in motivation. What prompts people to behave, to do the things they do? Well, what's the appeal of this book? 
readers discover that the Arantia revelation is simply and primarily a description of reality with a capital R. It describes spiritual realities coming directly to us from the spiritual world, directly to us. It can't be anything else. It's as real as night and day. So about the real, what, what, let's develop the idea a little bit. Jesus actually talked about what's real directly. He said he actually gave something the book calls a discourse on reality. So let's listen. I want to quote what the biographer of Jesus says. And this is coming from Jesus. The eye of the material mind, you know, our own eyes and mind, perceives a world of factual knowledge. The eye of the spiritualized intellect discerns a world of true values. And you've been hearing already today about values. These two views, synchronized and harmonized, reveal the world of reality. Okay, continuing with Jesus, wherein wisdom, wisdom interprets the phenomenon of the universe in terms of progressive personal experience. Excuse me away from getting away from my mic here. In terms of progressive personal experience. Personal experience, progressive, moving, okay. So let's get into this statement. We are aware of two realities. One, the world of facts. Two, an inner world, an inner reality that is developing spiritualized intellect. And earlier, uh, Byron had pointed out the necessity for developing intellect. And this is so powerful in the Arantia Revelation. Now, such an intellect, guided by an inner divinity, can discern, can become aware of, an inner world of values, values that we are irresistibly drawn to. In this reality, and here's something you've heard already, in this reality, we can recognize what is good. We mean, of course, love. What is true? What we're seeking here today, we're here for the truth. And what is beautiful? And we'll touch on that a little bit further out. Now, so here we are. Let me pause just a little and catch up. So here we are in these two realities. Two views, outer and inner, synchronized and harmonized together. This reality is what all of us are engaged in. As we progress in this inner reality, our repository of wisdom, repository of wisdom, and our ability to discern, to develop keen insight and judgment grows. So we get wiser, better, as we live in both outer and inner realities. You could say that we grow up. We grow up. OK. So here we are in these realities. The world of fact is boundless. We can find many ways to describe the world of fact. And that inner world, well, we build that. We build an ever-deepening wisdom to interpret both of these realities. That kind of building is both personal personal, our inner, most individual and private self, and progressive, ever getting broader and deeper. Does that make sense? Are we hanging in there, all of us? OK. Personal experience, broader and deeper. So, and Jesus tells us that if we're going to grow, we can't just plug into old ways old organizations, old authorities. Conformity won't do it. Our experience is going to be individual and unique. 
and within our growing power to understand, to value the highest and the best, we make free choices. Free choices. And with expanding wisdom, better choices. So Jesus tells us we are called to follow him into this simple injunction, be ye perfect, as your holy father is perfect. How often does that appear? That is the direction. That is the outcome of greater wisdom and greater wisdom. Perfection, of course, into eternity. Well, so, let's listen to how the spirit teachers actually speak this, describe it. What are we building? Ever-growing, ever-expanding wisdom arising out of our personal experience, we're building a soul. Here's how the spirit teachers explain that. And again, listen to the text very carefully from the Arantia book. God evolves the spirit soul upon the material and mortal mind in accordance with the free will choosing of the personality, the personality we've been hearing about, which has been bestowed upon such a mortal creature as us by the parental act of God as a father. The parental act of God as a father. So the, the use of God as a father, or the statement such, is functioning as a parent. And of course, it's perfectly appropriate. What other way of understanding it would be possible for all of us? So, collected, what is real is that we all have a soul. It's the gift of the parental father developed as we make free will choices in this two-part. Okay, let's move it on. Now, how do we know all this? What's real? We all made a choice today. How did that happen? You learned about this event, you thought about it, you evaluated its content for yourself, and you chose to come here. That is the activity of a soul. Your soul, your soul is real, you're present. The way the law of gravity is present. Okay. Well. Let's review this. Now, value choosing, the choices of your inner self. Now, not all of your inner life is value choosing. You know, what you had for breakfast is not value choosing. Your inner life is, is not always about choosing. Random thoughts, memories, taking care of business, not so much value choosing. But how you conduct your relationships, your relationships, perhaps that's most common, most powerful arena for value choosing. This is, this is, after all, your love arena. And how much does this have to do with both your success and certainly your happiness? So if you don't mind, uh, these are big abstractions as explained by our teachers. And the only way I can get very concrete and specific about that is I want to tell you a little bit of how this old retired professor came to be here and some of the, cho the choices and the developments that came with me. To do so, I have to tell you a little bit of my own discoveries, if you don't mind. Here's a real setting, my own factual life. I was born in a small rural town in North Dakota. How about that? I'm the only one you know. Uh, <laughs> Born in North Dakota, among German immigrant farmers, they were all Catholic. I was the youngest of four, baptized in quite an impressive church, a kind of prairie cathedral. You've seen those churches, even out on the prairies. Now, according to our definitions, when I was born, I had no soul. No soul, only the potential for a soul. I was, like you, dependent on others to survive. I made, I made no free will choices, as you recall. There are no free will choices then. I was all potential, just like 
a bright white empty envelope, small but beautiful box. But I started growing and becoming aware of factual realities. I became aware of my family, especially my siblings. I understood them because they seemed most like me. We came to understand pretty quickly the whys of everything around us, the simple and compelling realities in a little kid's life. We, we were starting to fill that empty box, that envelope with awareness of realities. Okay, well, incidentally, do we ever fill that box? Apparently not, that box keeps getting bigger, <laughs> bigger. Anyway, we understood our parents, who they were and what they did for us. We understood our home, our need for food and clothing, easy to get the clothing bit, you know, know what the weather's like in North Dakota. Um, so, so we quickly, quickly came to understand all the facets of survival as kids. They were all real and necessary, the factual realities. All right, continue. But for me, a big part of what we did was not connected to any realities. You see, we good Catholics had to go to church every Sunday. And when I was about six, I was made an altar boy. Big surprise. Now, what I did and saw there did not seem real. Honestly, it seemed sort of unnecessary. Like, how is this connected to basic things? Now, it's not my purpose today, and I don't want to go into churches and traditional religion. I just wanted to say that in my childhood world, churches and religion did not seem to have any basis in, necess in a necessary reality. But because the activity of this church was forced on us, us kids, altar boys, I had questions. And when I was serving as an altar boy, you, you, you've seen it in movies, the outfit, the cross, the surplus, the white stuff. And as a little kid, I'm saying, what's this for? Is God, this is the way it phrased to me as a little kid, is God impressed with this? And so, questions. Well, what's happening? I was developing a soul. And you know what that was? Questions. I want to know the truth. And here's something I'm exposed to, and I don't see the truthiness in it. So, questions. Soul is developing. And I was becoming conscious, like you, all of us. I'm observing, thinking, evaluating, starting to make choices. Okay, I'm becoming aware that I'm a person, like my siblings, but distinct from them. And I could and did make different choices. I read lots of comic books. I got a paper route. I was hired by the theater owner to make popcorn in our little town theater. Now, my brother did none of these things. My soul and my identity were unique and growing in a different direction from his. So now, I have a soul. It's always present, it observes, evaluates, chooses, and acts, it's very real, just as you do. Well, as I said, not all of my choosing is about soul. Some of my choices are trivial. They're not particularly value. Well, what are my value choices again? And this bears repeating, my relationships. I'm just developing relationships. How I choose to love those around me. And here is a dividing point. Something new and powerful enters. I'm also becoming aware of some kind of force, some kind of force that's prompting my value choices. Something there. Now, we all have this force. Maybe you haven't heard the word force. I think of Star Wars. May the force be with you, et cetera. It really is the same force. Now, as a child, I'm not fully conscious of that, but I'm vaguely aware that I am pulled, pulled. I have an urge toward wanting to understand everything here, toward the truth, being pulled toward the truth, understanding realities. 
Now, what are those? I see and come to understand kindness, goodness, and those around me, my family, and my cousins across the street. And I'm getting a certain feeling of joy in being with them. And also in beautiful things. In my case, like our family piano and my older sister playing Chopin on the piano. Wow, I love Chopin's polonaise. My older sister. What is this in a little kid feeling, listening to Chopin? Pull, traction, celebrating beauty. Other things that were joyous to me, even sort of more mundane stuff, our Ford car. I'm a car guy, I love cars. But our Ford car that could move us to the capital city and buy stuff, boy, that was great. Now for me and my family, those are powerful attractions as a, in a little kid. So you see what's happening, soul developing, choices, observing that there are certain things that are really awesome, value choices. Now in my family especially, Attraction toward music. Whoa, are we music. Since that was really present in my environment, in fact, all six of us in my family, we were all performers in one way or another. And let me tell you something about my little town in North Dakota. Lawrence Welk was born there. <laughs> yeah. Yes, my parents knew him. You're seeing that the two of us born in the same town in North Dakota. Now, all of this that I'm telling you is pretty normal, isn't it? I mean, all of us go through stuff like this. What's divine about it? Well, it's the pull, the urge toward these good, joyful things in my kid life. It's value choices, value choices. I felt them. I know now that I have a divine coach whispering in my ear, telling me to choose more of these warm and joyful experiences. The spirit teacher in our revelation in the Urantia book says it very directly, there really is a true and genuine inner voice. True and genuine inner voice. It's a spirit leading. So I'm being led, pulled to those good things, and I can, of course, choose to ignore the voice. I'm pretty selfish sometimes. Sometimes I, uh, you know, it's a bit of a battle, but I'm always free to choose. Now, so naturally, I follow the urge to grow. The growth is so slow, we barely notice it. Today, it means, and the word we use now, we didn't, I didn't know this word, means to evolve. Although in my earlier years, you know, oh, what's evolve? Well, I want to interrupt just a second because some of those things build on each other because speaking of evolve, I think we're going to talk about this a little more firmly, but later in my life got very familiar with this. This is Ken Wilbur, a theory of everything. You know what the theory of everything is? Everything evolves. Finally, uh, an all-consuming theory, somebody else is going to talk about that. Uh, in a little more focused way, but the issues starting to grow ar arise and we discover that all of these things are leading us into a larger truth. Well, of course I left my childhood world. I was sent off to a Benedictine monastery with the idea that I should be a priest. The teachers in my school, the nuns, my Catholic school said, um, this told my parents this, and I'm 12 years old, 11 years old, and they, they said, this boy should go to a better school than ours. Not surprising, I suppose. Well, you know what the priest did seem mostly unreal to me, like the altar boy kind of thing, but I went off to the school anyway. At one point, I was actually asked to leave that school <laughs> because the months running the place not, not, not bad people, you know, running the school could tell that I wasn't buying it. It was unreal. So I left it in due time. Yeah, I left it in due time, of course. Well, so I still have, like you, my divine coach. 
pulling me to learn, to do all the things that mean here on our planet, growing up, maturing, making better choices. And that's why I'm here today. I'm here today. It's the stuff of soul. So are we clear about what soul is? OK. Now, if you look at my biography, well, um, Byron mentioned it a bit. I come from secular higher education. I chose to live and work in schools. Why? I could follow my best urges there, those urges, seek the truth, the real, in higher education, you bet, and serve my students in kindness, in a kind of sensitivity, the way my family and many of my teachers had been kind to me, pull of goodness. And I could wallow, I could hang out in the beautiful there in higher education, art of all kinds. What a place. The university is a great place for art. Now, and in school, I could read, I read some awesome comic books, you know, like Moby Dick. What a great comic book. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I could continue my, with, the, with the music. I could continue to indulge. Now, my, my tastes had grown far away from Lawrence Welk to classical music. <laughs> and I can discover and celebrate, as I play it in my car all the time, Mozart's Requiem, the best piece of music ever written. I just feel that it is. Anyway, so. Let's be sure, as we proceed, that we understand life's most important realities. We each have a personality, an identity, parental act of God, that personality, a parental act, father act. And that's unique to us. Within that identity, we observe, we learn, we evaluate, and we choose to act. That identity makes value choices. Value choices, that is our soul. That soul is constantly growing, evolving towards what's better and greater, towards goodness, truth, and beauty, more of enlarged, deeper understanding, greater love, greater truth, growing wisdom, growing wisdom and seeking always, always the lovely lifting up of the beautiful, always. For my wife and me, it's the stunning red rocks of Sedona, Arizona. That's where we live now. And also a subscription to the Phoenix Symphony where we go regularly. My wife is with me, Do you, my, can I introduce her? Is that, would that be in order? Rosalind, let me say something about Rosalind and I. Would you stand, Rosalind? Thank you. Hi. <laughs> yeah. Incidentally, this is our 50th wedding anniversary next month. Wow. Sometimes I think, well, people congratulate on us, and I always maybe irritate my dear spouse when I say, well, maybe it's lack of imagination here, this 50-year stuff. In any case, we are going to Paris in July, getting on a boat. This is a celebration of our 50s. OK, well, back to the issues. The lovely lifting up. Now. All this pulling, this evolving, the, this being drawn quietly, being directed by a divine coach, a divine coach, always inner, moving us in that direction, always making suggestions, always trying to adjust our course of action toward the good, the better, the best, the more beautiful, reaching toward greater truth. Now. The Arantia Revelation calls this inner coach the thought adjuster, which is a kind of surprising name, isn't it? The thought adjuster. But, you know, pretty accurate. Yeah? All this pulling, being coached to more seeking, more experience, more observing, choosing, doing. 
It's exciting. Hasn't that been like playing basketball? For me, like falling in love. Whoa. It's a great adventure. And thus the gift we all have. Byron calls it romance. And it is. It's romance, isn't it? Really. Who doesn't like romance? Romance kind of the, the ice cream of life. Romance. OK. The rest of my story really is kind of unneeded, because I think you'll recognize in your own, in your own life coming. I, like you, had certain growth spurts. Now, I'm thinking about how this evolution of the soul, how it expands. There comes a time when there are growth spurts, and I think the metaphor is ideal. Three major examples from my life that were powerful in altering, changing my being. Uh, and I'm going to mention them because they might be useful to you, too. First, the word love was mentioned, was used sometimes in my church. But honestly, I saw a little of it. Now, I certainly felt love quite often, quite often in my home and school. But while still a teen, still looking for reality, some truth that seemed authentic to me, I came upon a book, and I don't remember how I happened, to, how a teen is going to find this book, because I'm knocking around on the football team, you know, I'm studying Latin in school. But I think my inner coach set this up, and we're going way back now to 60 years. Written by a psychologist, the book that I actually not assigned anywhere, not a person from religion. I must have been 19 when I found this. Eric Fromm, The Art of Loving. Whoa, uh, this is not from religion. This comes from a psychologist. And is that, does that have an impact? And I want to quote just one line from Eric Fromm. Sixty years ago, he said he taught me that loving, loving was the only successful way to live. And successful. Very popular, very, very real. And he said, and listen to this quote, love is the only sane and satisfactory answer to the problem of human existence. Only sane and satisfactory answer. Now, I felt that was true. Kindness all in my life. So this was real, a true value. And that, that, this was a guiding star for me. And of course, we've learned the Arantia book, core truth of the Arantia teachings. Now, I'm coming to the end. Another growth spurt, and I'm going to move this along. My discovery in the 70s of a book from a writer who didn't believe anything he had heard about God, but he observed that everyone seems to have a powerful pull toward quality. Quality. Think about the word, meaning of that word, toward excellence, toward the good, the true, the beautiful. Again, no God, no religion here, powerful pull. And in my experience, again, when I read that, that was real. Because obviously, I had felt that. Reality check, folks. You know this one? Zen in the art of motorcycle maintenance. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How about that? Now, this is in the 70s, long ago. And you know what? I got the quote here, I think. The most, most widely read philosopher ever in print. Still a big seller. Uh, still a great story. So growth spurt. Remember? Oh, I'm just going along, agnostic professor, don't really believe in life, in, in, in God, certainly. Read a book, not from a church person, not from religion, but from a guy, not so different from me, even close to my age, who's looking hard for the truth. So there it was, growth spurt. OK. I'm coming to the end here. <laughs> All right. Third life-changing example, a book. And this, this could be a long story, but I won't go into it. Young agnostic professor browsing a bookstore in Ann Arbor, Michigan. A gigantic book on the shelf 
kind of falls off the shelf and hits me on the head? <laughs> yeah, the Arantia book. Pure accident, pure accident. You know, it's typical, you know, browse in the New Age section, just hanging out in the bookstore. You come, I come upon this big book, huge, 36 bucks. And I'm, what on earth is that? Pull it off, look at the table of contents. What? Uh-uh, uh-uh. $36 book? No. So I go through the table of contents. Can you imagine, young professor? Put the thing back. I'm not paying 36 bucks for any book. Sorry. That was on a Saturday. On Sunday, I think, I wonder what was in that book. <laughs> yeah. On Monday again, what do you suppose that was? I've never, I mean, as I, you, you know from my academic background, my whole life has been reading like this. And this book fits no pattern, nothing that I had ever seen. Well, Monday again, I'm back to work in the class, you know, et cetera. Tuesday, Wednesday, I can't go back to the bookstore. By Saturday, it's driving me nuts. It is, so I, I'm gonna just go back and buy the book, pay the 36, 36 bucks, what the heck. Bring the book home. Anyway, enough of that story. I let it sit there for a while. I, I couldn't believe it was real. Then I started dabbling in it and it became more and more. So, what could it be? By that time, I knew it was real. And you know what? By that time, I had read the world, a good part of the world's greatest writings. I had read them. It was part of my academic preparation, as you might guess, for a literature professor. Well, I could tell the Urantia book is way beyond what human beings are capable of. It is way beyond, which is to say right off the top of my head, this can't be hoaxed. This, this is not a human production. And I didn't need any stories about how it came to be. I knew it was way beyond what human beings could do. I had read Shakespeare. I had read Milton. I had read Dante. I had read Ralph Waldo Emerson. I was really up on all those people. And this, OK, direct teachings from the real spirit world. So the book answered all my desperate reality-seeking questions. Yes, there is a God. Yes, there is an afterlife. We're all being pulled, pulled along an ascending path to God perfection. It's not a belief. It's not religion, as in most of those traditions. It's not about any authorities or organizations. It's just simple facts of reality, simple facts of soul. Life moving right into afterlife, our same soul continuing into eternity. And it all makes perfect sense, like gravity, you know, like night and day, like snow in North Dakota, <laughs> perfect reality. So we're all scientists today. We're all looking for the real. Now, another thing. Today we know that other scientists have been actually in that afterlife. And they've come back to tell us it's real. And I brought some my reality checks here. You heard of it? Yeah. Dr. Eben Alexander, <laughs> proof of heaven, big best self. What happens? What happened when he died and was dead for seven days? Same thing, another big bestseller, Dr. Mary Neal, drowned in a river in Chile on a kayak accident, got pulled out of the water, dead, came back, wrote a book. Another doctor, Neal, <laughs> Die and get a book deal. Die and get a book deal. <laughs> well, you've all heard about the near-death experience. Thousands of those, thousands of those, and this doctor collected evidence of the afterlife. Jeffrey Long. Okay. They all come, and they say it's real. So... Ladies and gentlemen, I'm so pleased to be here to listen to my version of reality. So I'm going to stop now. The card says stop now. So I'm done. Thank you so much.
we got about uh, 10 minutes for questions. And by the way, you know, uh, I am a book publisher, but I will not do any deals with you if you're dead. So <laughs> forget it. Forget it. It's not going to work. Uh, you have to come back, and then we can maybe, maybe, maybe. Well, you could come, but everybody else does. Why wouldn't you, Byron? Well, I might do it. Yeah. I just might. Yeah. yeah. Well, we'll do they it. Say, none of them wanted to come back. These people that wrote these books, have you seen them? They did not want to come back to this life. They did yeah. not. Yeah. Yeah, they all funny. said, it's great here. <laughs> oh, yeah. They're not coming back. And, and part of it, you know, I believe that they were determined to come back to serve the purpose that they, in fact, are serving, these bestseller books. Yeah. We're going to oh, share the sorry. mic. Okay. So, I'm sorry about now. I'm used to projecting, you know, in the classroom, so I'm cavalier about mics. Anyway, uh, questions? Yes. Um, Professor Kraft, mm -hmm. the question is, I think you said there are really kind of two truths. One is Inner. science and... Science? Uh -huh. and, Realities, factual reality. Yeah, and, and that's, a, that's what I wanted to question, because it seems to me a lot of science, and maybe this is maybe a Buddhist thought, Mm -hmm. A lot of science is based on sen senses, yeah, measure. and a lot of the senses seem to be very deceiving. But yes. you're, you're not seeing reality. Yes. So, that, yeah. so observation of science, in a way, is uh -huh. seeing deception. Yes. You know what you're saying, uh, is that, and, Andrew, Andrew, it's very limited. Uh -huh. Science is very limited. Science proceeds by hypotheses, you know, uh, get an idea, test it, measure it. But it's in the material world, and the really deep, profound things, the things that are really important to us, mm -hmm. you can't get anywhere with science. If you saw the movie Contact, remember Jodie Foster's movie Contact? Yeah. When that boyfriend of hers asks her, well, what her name is, I don't recall. Yeah. Uh, he, he says, um, let's call her, well, it, it was Jody. Jodie Foster. Right. Well, let's say Jodie. He says, Okay, Jody, did you love your father? Uh -huh. And she says, she looks astonished at the question. She's the premier scientist. She says, of course I love my father. And he says to her, prove it. <laughs> prove it? Well, science, proof, evidence. How much, how far can you get into the truth with a capital T, mm -hmm. with just evidence and that sort of proof? Um, limited, mm -hmm. limited. Hi. Um, you spoke about the thought adjuster and then the spiritual coach, the guidance. Yeah. And I'm just uh, curious about the res resolution of that in my own uh, path. It's been like the boon, the spiritual boon of an awakened life, where the awakening yeah. is, I am that. Yeah. You know, the God, see, Atman, God lives yeah. within me as me. Yeah. So what's the actual resolution of actually, it sounds like a transcendent comp mm -hmm. of a thought adjuster or coach yeah. versus it's really me. It's me, myself yeah. as I. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it never, it never really gets resolved because it's eternity. It's forever. You, you might want to comment on that. So uh, if you could restate again that you, you've had um, a sense of it, thou art that, that yeah. you, th it's already yeah. identified, yeah. Uh, as opposed yeah. to something that's beyond you, that's yeah. Yeah. external, so to speak. Yeah. And yeah, it, it would certainly encompasses that, because there are levels of consciousness. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't talk about fusion, what they call the fusion yeah. of your personhood, your personality with the thought adjuster. Uh -huh. And so when that fusion event happens, your body combusts, and you can't even be here. Yeah. So that's like the rainbow body experience in Tibetan Buddhism. Mm. So the, the, fu the fusion is, uh, if, if you've identified totally with it, you, you'd be out of here anyway. Mm. Uh, there's a bodhisattva kind of intervening level. I think there's people who are, as uh, one of my friends was saying, they're virtually fused, but they haven't combusted and left yet. Right. And, and th those are the very high, high avatars you know, here on the planet. <laughs> So if you have this identity, it's, it's provisional. Yeah, it's a provisional it's identity. I, mean, yeah. I think we've all accessed some version of that. So it's it's this interesting dance where you feel like there is you in relationship to something, and then you are it. But that's like that momentary little spark yes. of reality. But it gets to the point where it builds just a fusion, and then we're not even 3D anymore. You're not even 3D. And, and so the, you're having glimpses of this enlightenment that is this fusion event that's in your future life after you're out of the body. We haven't talked much about it. It's a good time to state that when you get to the afterlife, according to the Arantia book, 
You're, you're just basically living like you are now, but it's on a higher planet, and there's more elements. Instead of 100 elements, there's 200 elements in their atomic chart. So they're in this higher world that's a sphere, and people are walking around just like these books that we were hearing about. And there you become a Buddha, so to speak. Maybe not the first world, but it's like the second or third or fourth or fifth. Most people by the fifth, these are actual lives on higher planets. And so you keep, you rekey on a new planet to a new body, and you do a lot more meditation and loving, such that you, this identity with the dwelling spirit becomes one and un, un, in, unalterable. Because you've made it inexorable, you're not exorable, what's the word? Inexorable? Or in, 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 inexorable? No, not inexorable, but inexorable. un. No. Inextricable. Inextricable. Irreversible. Irreversible. Decision. Irreversible forever decision to follow this and to be one with it forever. And you'd never not be one with it. But there's much, 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 much more beyond that. That's the amazing thing in the, in the Heavenly Realms in the Rancho book. There's so much more information about even after that. Because you're going upward to the central universe. So you have much more to do when you get to the central domain, which is outside of space-time, mm -hmm. much, much more. Mm -hmm. So the adventure is beyond belief. And this is a lot more interesting than reincarnating back to this joint. Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> one little mention. <coughs> Excuse me, I lost it. I, lost, I was just going to pick up on something earlier, but it slipped away from me. Uh, we'll invite another question. One more question? That comment, Byron, um, uh, reincarnating back to this joint, <laughs> made me wonder, what does the Urantia material say about uh, this Earth? Are we the lowest rung of the ladder of human existence in the universe? Uh, I would guess, <laughs> but I'm wondering. <laughs> We are at the lowest rung of the ladder of humanoid beings. So there's no lower world. There's no hell realm, so to speak. <laughs> it feels like this is hell, the hell realm. And because this planet is a rebellion, we call it a rebellion planet. There was an angelic rebellion on the planet. So those of you that came a little late, you may have missed that. So we're, we're a planet that was quarantined from the rest of the universe because we were re rebels, we being the angelic host. So we're at the lowest of the low in terms of the morality here. Normal planets do not have genocides. They don't have World War II and three, you know, they don't have nuclear holic. They don't have that. So we're the lowest planet, and one of the one of the worst planets. So that's why we needed this big revelation, these big revelations, incarnation of our Creator, these big books to explain this. So I think we're going to close up. If yeah. You okay. Closing. It's just, not a closing statement. Well, maybe this is a closing statement. One of the things that the, that the revelators celebrate, they said, you people who have grown up or started on Earth, on, the, on your rancha, you go into your next lives, they are admiring of you. You're a hero. There's even a word for it. I, 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 that's it. Uh, because growing up on... This planet Earth is a rough deal. It is a rough deal. And you're getting boot camp, heavy duty training here. So we can celebrate the fact that we're Earthlings and we are getting boot camp here. That's what the Tibetans said. Yeah. Thank you, Robert Kraft. Thank you. Amazing teacher. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Uh,